Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's show. Uh, it's me and Matt with you right now. And today with our guest, uh, we'll be discussing uh, the city of Los Angeles and crime. How a city has been plagued by a lawless culture of gang violence, intimidation, and murder for over 50 years. The Bloods, the Crips, drug cartels? No, the gangs we're talking about on today's show are all comprised of members of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Cerise Castle, welcome to the show. Um, so you are the you are the author of a fifteen part series uh, that's currently on on Knock LA, uh, documenting basically a fifty year history of violence um, as it pertains to a series of gangs that operate at, you know within the LA County Sheriff's Department that are comprised of LA Sheriff's County deputies. Um, just like I mean, it's hard to draw. A diff- like the, the conclusion suggested by this investigative series is that the most vicious and dangerous gangs in Los Angeles are have badges and operate not just like as a gang in a metaphorical sense, but like literally by California criminal code is a gang in every sense of the word. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, you, you say at the top, I mean, like in, in your pieces, uh, like at the at sort of a headline, you 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 list the section of the California penal code that uh, pertains to. What like how do how to determine like whether an organization is a criminal gang? And according to the penal code, it has to have three or more people that one have a common name or identifying sign or symbol, has as one of its primary activities the commission of one of a long list of California criminal offenses, and three, whose members have engaged in a quote pattern of criminal gang activity, either alone or together. How does that fit the gangs that you started you're investigating in this series? Yeah, well, I opened the series with um, the definition of the California Penal Code um, really intentionally because, you know, these deputy gangs really aren't any different than criminal street gangs. The only difference is that, you know, they are able to operate with a badge and impunity. I think it is unfortunate and irresponsible that our judicial system has not categorized these deputy gangs as such. Um, If you look in local media, the sparse coverage that has been on these deputy gangs, there's a lot of hesitation to use the word gang in this case. Um, I was very intentional with using that word because, you know, these are gangs and we need to call them what they are. Yeah, I feel like, you know, usually if it's covered at all, it's within the context of, uh, you know, dirty cops or, you know, rogue police officers or, you know, cops who are criminals or doing bad things. But like, these are gangs in every sense of the word and including like uh, tattoos to mark acts of violence committed, uh, hand signals, um, like the gang names and connections to the prison system as well. Yeah, um, they're operating throughout all of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department um, from deputies all the way up to senior management. An interesting thing about, um, you know, the way the department is set up is that, you know, Deputies, once they complete their time in the academy, they are placed in the jails, and that's where they have their first assignment for, you know, a year, possibly one to three years. And one of the biggest deputy gangs, um, you know, that I have uncovered and done some reporting on is the 3000 Boys and the 2000 Boys, and they operate within the jails. So, you know, as people are, you know, fresh faced coming out of their training, they're being, you know, told how to do their jobs by these, you know, guys that have been working in gangs and gang groups for for years. And they're told that this is the way that you should do police work and this is the way you're able to move up the ranks and have a solid career. I mean, it, it's a it's a massive and stunning volume of information that you've investigated and compiled in this series. But I mean, before we get into it, sort of a basic question: what is the like? What is the di- the difference between the LAPD and the LA County Sheriff's Department? So yeah, that's a really good question. Most people don't really know the difference. The difference between the LAPD and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is really jurisdictional. The Los Angeles Police Department patrols and has a jurisdiction within the city of Los Angeles while the sheriff's de, the sheriff's department they patrol unincorporated Los Angeles County as well as a number of smaller cities that contract law enforcement services with the sheriff's department that's places like Whittier, Compton, West Hollywood, Universal City. And is there something about the way like 
the sheriff's department is organized or like the remit of their authority that lends itself to like the va- the massive proliferation of these cliques and gangs operating under their aegis? Well, I, I think that if you're looking back historically at the sheriff's department, they have sort of prided themselves on being a sort of lawless, rough and tumble, rough and tough um, group of, I don't even want to say government employees. Um, For a long time, um, up until the early 1960s, the sheriff's department was actually a posse. Um, So the sheriff, who was mostly appointed um, by his preceding sheriff, would you know, hand out badges and qualifications to friends, movie stars, celebrities. Um, and, and that's who was in the sheriff's department. And when something went wrong, he put out a call and you'd have this ragtag group of the sheriff's personal friends responding and, you know, fighting crime. They didn't have uniforms until, you know, the 1950s. They didn't have an academy until the 1950s. It was really just, okay, like, we're going to base our employees on moral character and whether the sheriff thinks that this is a good person, someone who's trustworthy enough to enforce the law as we see fit. So they've always sort of identified as these, as these cowboys. Um, well, one of the gangs so, you write about is literally calls themselves the cowboys. Yeah. It's yeah. this kind of so, uh, based on personal connection and this kind of peer group of, you know, friends and confidants. Uh, but also this 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 ideal of oneself as sort of a frontier justice. Yeah, definitely. There, I mean, I follow a lot of sheriff social media pages um, that are you know run by deputies, and the attitude expressed in all of these in all of these places is that you know we are the most hard charging badass of Los Angeles law enforcement, and they are they're happy and they're proud of that fact. I want to get into the, the 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 quite long history of like this gang culture within the sheriff's department, but like just just overall, like how did you first learn about this phenomenon of gangs in the sheriff's department in L.A. and how did you begin investigating this story? Uh, well, I grew up in Los Angeles County, and growing up here, you know, as a person of color, you hear a lot about deputy gangs. It's it's common knowledge in you know many neighborhoods that these deputies target it's it it wasn't news to to many of the communities that i covered and and to me myself like this wasn't really news but it was something that has been historically undercovered and ignored by most media and i think that that is a product of you know most most los angeles media frankly doesn't think it's worth investing in poor black and brown communities and that's where a lot of this injustice and in, is taking place, unfortunately. So I, I was always really interested in, the, in this topic, you know, starting from childhood. I, I was around 12 years old when my brother told me about the Vikings and told me to, you know, watch myself in interactions with sheriff's deputies. If they were white and had a shaved head, they were probably a Viking. And that it wouldn't end up well for me if, I, I was in the presence of one of them. I, throughout my life, I tried to find, you know, any sort of like newspaper coverage or God forbid, even like a graduate student thesis looking at these deputy gangs, but there was nothing. Um, you know, like I said, from the time I was a kid all the way up until last summer, I took these trips to the library looking for information and there was nothing to be found. I, I, During the summer um, last year, while covering the George Floyd protests, I was actually hit with a less than lethal munition. Uh, One of those, yes, less than lethal uh, weapons that the uh, police use now. Yeah. I was hit with one, and the injuries resulting from that placed me on bed rest for about six months. So I wasn't able to go to work. I wasn't able to do my job um, out in the field like I was used to. So... Instead, I decided that I would take the time to find out everything I could about deputy gangs in Los Angeles County and write the first ever historic, historic outline of what they do, who they are and who they've harmed. Well, 
I want to go like the, your story begins in the uh, the late 1960s and like the sort of first documented uh, gang, uh, sort of sh- sheriff's deputies gang. Uh, it, it begins during something called the, the Chicano Moratorium and deals with a uh, journalist and critic of law enforcement, a man named Ruben Salazar. Could you describe, well, first of all, what the Chicano Moratorium was and the circumstances that led to Ruben Salazar uh, being killed or murdered by the by a police officer or sorry, a sheriff's deputy? Yeah. So Ruben Salazar had been very outspoken and critical against law enforcement in Los Angeles County. Um, for a number of years, he actually, the night before his death, he told a number of friends that he suspected he was being watched by law enforcement and that he thought that harm may come to him. So the next day he went to the Chicano moratorium, which was a protest of about 25,000, uh, mostly Latinx people in East Los Angeles at a park that has since been renamed for Ruben Salazar. And it, the day started out peacefully, um, but as the sheriff's department rolled in, um, there's sort of there's a long running joke with the sheriff's department. The orders given that day by the captain were to keep a low profile, but th- that's not what happened. They went in by the hundreds and they attacked people and brutalized them that had been peacefully gathered. And one deputy um, actually shot a tear gas canister into a bar where Ruben Salazar was sitting that tear gas canister hit him in the head and he was killed. His body was left in that bar for a number of hours. His team didn't know where he was. And I believe it was like a day later, they actually told his boss what had happened. Um, The resulting investigation into that was one of the longest and most expensive um, in the county's history. And the Salazar family ended up setting, settling with the county for I believe it was seven hundred thousand um, dollars because of his death. Well, I mean, this is a this is a story that you return to again and again in terms of just how much money L.A. County spends to settle, uh, you know, in civil cases brought by the relatives or victims themselves of these gangs. I think it's something like a hundred million dollars that they, yeah, they, that they, we they, know they, of. Yeah, that we know of. The interesting thing about the money is that you know I'm really only able to track settlements. Those are clearly defined. The big question that remains is attorney's fees. Taxpayers are responsible for attorney's fees on both sides when the case is settled. And cases are settled, I want to say, 99% of the time. So when you read about, oh, okay, this man got $10 million, that's just a settlement. That's not taking into account how much his attorney's fees cost, which can be you know, another million dollars themselves because these cases take years and years and years because the county hires these highly litigious firms that draw out the process of the case and bill hundreds of thousands of hours. Um, So again, that's attorney's fees on both sides that can potentially total in the millions. And those aren't paid the same way that settlements are. It's a little bit harder to track that stuff. So whereas settlements are sort of, you know, plainly listed okay, we're going to write this check for this amount of money to this person for this. Attorney's fees aren't run that way. They're paid out of different funds. And it's much harder to track, you know, a payment to a law firm. Uh, It doesn't it doesn't always say, oh, here's the check for, you know, working on this case for the past seven years. You know, it's, it's much harder to calculate that. So we really don't know how expensive this is, but we know it's at least at least one hundred million dollars. And. A great deal of the the information that you um, compile and report on in in this series is culled from sworn depositions in these lawsuits filed against the county, right? Yes. I, so I want to go back. You mentioned um, during the Chicano moratorium, this this anti war protest. The police were told by their superiors to quote keep a low profile. Uh, later, could, could you explain how that phrase, like keep a low profile, became kind of a sort of a sick joke and motto for these these gangs themselves, or at least one in particular? Of course, yeah. So low profile, as I mentioned, that was sort of the instruction given to deputies that day, which they did not heed. Um, That phrase came back in a logo that um, was banned by Sheriff Jim McDonnell, but brought back by current Sheriff Alex Villanueva. It's called the Fort Apache logo. It shows a boot and a riot helmet, an old, an older model riot helmet, 
And around it, it says low profile. And I don't recall the words in Spanish, but what it translates to is a swift kick in the ass. And you can see this Fort Apache insignia um, generally around the East Los Angeles station where the Chicano moratorium took place in East LA. It was mostly deputies from that station that responded. They actually had, um, I'm, I'm not sh- quite sure how to call it, but the, the logo was placed in tile in their floor of the station for many, many years. Um, just yesterday, I was actually covering an event at the East Los Angeles Sheriff Station, and several deputies were wearing hats with the Fort Apache logo um, printed on them. The sergeant that came out to speak to the organizers for the event, um, you know, he was very, very anxious to express to me that he, quote, felt alliance to the black and brown, but he was wearing a pin with the Fort Apache logo on it, which, you know, makes a mockery of, you know, brutalizing the people of East Los Angeles. And, you know, Fort Fort Apache, of course, also refers to the, the, the famous John Ford Western with John Wayne and Henry Fonda, which, like, once again, underscores this this idea of the frontier and like, you know, that, that you're an outpost, you're the, you're the, you're the U S cavalry besieged by these, you know, uh, the, the natives, these, these savages who you have to sort of like, uh, you know, temper through violence and, you know, bring law and order or civilization to. Yeah. 100%. Um, I mean, speaking of like that idea of like the frontier and like the, the frontier of returning home, Um, And specifically as it relates to the Chicano moratorium, which is a protest against the Vietnam War, uh, there's a quote in your piece from a man who was a Marine in Vietnam who ended up uh, investigating or looking into like some of these, uh, uh, like he was looking into like a a certain, these deputy gangs in a case and that you have a quote from him here where he says, in Vietnam, we served in a place where we didn't belong. We really didn't care what happened to the people who lived there. When it was over, we were going home. We were taught that the lives of the Vietnamese didn't carry the same weight as ours and that of our fellow soldiers. Uh, similarly, Linwood deputies are paid to drive in to fight in a war in a community they have no vested interest in. They spend their days and nights in Linwood, abusing and maliciously direct, disrupting the lives of those who look, act, and live differently than they do. Linwood deputies know, now know, as we knew in Vietnam, that their superiors approve of their actions and that there are no consequences for their act. Because you talk about like this idea of like the, the, the connection between like imperial violence and like carried out by the U.S. military in Vietnam and in foreign countries, but also this idea that like the maintenance of empire requires this kind of re- a return of a frontier to the America itself that is directed at its own citizens. Yeah, I think you I think you really summed it up nicely there. I mean, there's there's a huge parallel um, when you look at how the. Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department hired for a long time. They were actually going to, you know, Midwestern states and recruiting, you know, nice white boys from Iowa to come and, you know, beat up on the brown folks in East Los Angeles and the black folks in South L.A. Um, And, you know, even even to this day, a, a number of deputies don't live in the neighborhoods that they patrol. Um, You know, they live out in mostly what I've found is um, the Antelope Valley area, uh, very far away from these, from these stations where they're, where they're brutalizing people. And yeah, I mean, I think David Lynn, it really summed it up in that quote. They don't, they don't have a vested interest. They don't, because of their training, like I was speaking to earlier, they don't really see the people that they're sworn to serve and protect as, as humans. They see them as, you know, potential criminals that need to be, taken off the streets and and incarcerated. I, I believe it was one deputy who actually framed a man for a murder who said when, when this man was exonerated, he said he didn't mind that he had the man had been exonerated because the man was a criminal and he would catch him again and put him away later. I mean, I think like, you know, you've probably heard before about, you know, like people who live in these neighborhoods that are heavy, heavily policed feel like the police are an occupying army in a lot of ways. But like the corollary to that is that the police and these sheriff's deputies themselves uh, view, view their own role as exi- they, like, they agree with that. They're like, yes, we are an occupying army and we are at war with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, I think that's how they would, well, I don't know if they would put it in those words, but I don't think the sentiment is too far off. Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier, this issue of um, 
like pins and baseball hats and uh, a, a, a lot of this a lot, a lot a lot of stuff this in your piece is sort of like uh, tracking down through like you know Etsy or eBay or like various sources I don't know how you found them these sort of these esoteric trinkets that are shared among like these these cliques to sort of denote in group loyalty and like gang affiliation and like the, the posters uh, coffee mugs pins like how did you go about like sussing these things out? Because I mean, it's sort of like like all of this. It's it's an open secret in that these people are you know flouncing it, flouting it, and wearing it from you know all the time advertising, but they're not really supposed to be advertising the fact that they're in a criminal gang. Yeah, I think that you know the fact that they're able to you know sell bumper stickers for the Lennox Grim Reapers on like <laughs> you know Etsy. I don't understand. I think the that Grim Reapers. To... What could be wrong with that? The wholesome, <laughs> wholesome law enforcement. They're they're the guys who kill you. What? Yeah, I just think that you know it just really speaks to how white supremacy works, right? These are people that target poor black and brown people, and you know the people that have been blowing on the whistle for this stuff for the past fifty years have been black and brown people. But unfortunately, the way that our society is set up, you know when those people speak out and call attention to things, no one listens and no one really gives a fuck. Um, there's a reason that I was the first person to write something like this, you know? Um, there's a reason, it's the same reason that these people are able to to sell stuff so openly online. No one really cares what happens to the people that they brutalize. That's well, That's the simple fact of it. Uh, I mean, speaking about the uh, the tattoo culture, which is again like something that is very much associated with like street gangs in like the popular imagination. Uh, you you have a quote from someone uh, claiming of the cowboys gang that the cowboy tattoo simply signifies that quote no person <laughs> has less rights than any other person, and that you treat the public equally and without bias. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a pretty funny explanation for like their the the, the cowboy gang tattoos. But like and many of these tattoos, like I think you have one example of uh, the caveman click, who they would have like tattoos of a little like sort of you know uh, alley oop esque figure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but like the, the with each fly buzzing around the head of the caveman stood for a violent interaction with um a citizen. Yeah, yeah, and interestingly enough, uh. One of the tattooed cavemen that we know of is our current under sheriff. His name is Timothy Murakami. Our current sheriff, Alex Villanueva, um, at a meeting in 2019, said of his time working at the East Los Angeles station, "We were all cavemen." And I mean, it gets it gets worse than that. I mean, there are in these gangs like an initiation rites that um, basically require one to uh, murder someone you know, in the line of duty or at least do some level of violence to an innocent person to be yeah. basically trusted and, you know, kind of initiated into this like inner culture within the larger one. Yeah. Basically you have to prove that you're willing to break the law to protect your fellow officers, um, to protect the gang that you're willing to, you know, do what it takes. That's everything from, you know, forging paperwork to, you know, beating up somebody, beating up a civilian, beating up another deputy that isn't going along with the program, as they call it, or, you know, even murdering a civilian. There are several cases that are currently ongoing in the courts right now where it's, it's alleged that the deputies responsible for the death of the individual had done so in order to earn a tattoo, in a gang. Well, you mentioned uh, 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 the targets of the, these gangs and their brutality and intimidation, you know, don't, you know, totally, they're not directed entirely at the civilian population. It's also directed at, you know, whistleblowers or rats within the department themselves who don't want to go along with this or uh, try to, yeah, like, blow the whistle. So, like, what was the one example you have of some guy who was mailed a gun in a package that was, like, rigged to, like, fire when it was opened, like a letter bomb? They yeah. got that shit from Acme, the Acme catalog. Probably. Yeah, I mean, there are tons of stories like that um, where, you know, people that aren't going along um, with what the gang wants are 
retaliated against in these incredibly violent ways. The gun in the box is one. Um, there was a story of one deputy who blew the whistle who had a drive-by done on his house where his children were sleeping. Um, I've spoken to, you know, other deputies that felt that they were just, you know, pushed out of their jobs, that they had, you know, uh, fraudulent cases into their conduct open because they had gone to their superiors or gone to the union and said, hey, there's some bad stuff going on here. And instead of action being taken, cases were opened up against them for reporting that stuff. And they were eventually had to leave the department. Yeah, it seems like you've got uh, there's the vibe you get from some of this is that not only do they have this ability, these gangs to discipline people who might speak up against them, but they've uh, either suborned or totally intimidated everybody above them, too. Yeah, I think that. I think that the gangs in 2021 th- have thoroughly infiltrated every part of the department all the way from the top. I mean, our, our, de- our current sheriff, you know, he said publicly that he has ties to at least one of these deputy gangs. And I think that his actions have, have given the rest of the groups sort of like a go ahead um, that, you know, they have approval from Alex. I, in my story, I wrote about, one gang in particular who refers to Villanueva as their friend. So I, I, I'm not sure if it's really, they've intimidated the top so much as that, you know, people within their ranks from previous generations have risen to the top and now they're dictating this culture from the top down. You mentioned when uh, you talked about growing up in LA and being warned about, uh, the Vikings, the Linwood Vikings, and that, like you know, if if you see a you know sheriff's deputy with a bald head, um, and, you know, uh, there's a good chance that they're in this Viking clique. I mean, is it an exaggeration to describe the Vikings as like a neo-Nazi gang? Uh, a federal judge would disagree with that. They were found to be a neo-Nazi gang um, in a federal finding, and many people that I've talked to that either were involved in the Vikings or new people that were involved in the Vikings have said, yes, there, there was definitely a culture of white supremacy. I mean, it's, and I think you'll see that in in all the gangs, really. You don't, even, even though that the gangs have sort of expanded now to include, you know, Latinx deputies, there's still very much a culture of white supremacy within them. You don't have to be white to be an agent of white supremacy. But uh, the the Vikings in particular, I mean, it's just, you know, one part of just it's really like horrifying to think about. But like you mentioned, like for in Linwood, how did the residents of Linwood begin to uh, fight back or resist what, you know, everyone who lives in these neighborhoods knew to be an open secret about the way these gangs treat the people that they're supposed to be protecting or policing? Well, for a long time, they couldn't do anything because the culture back then with, um, with suing law enforcement was a lot different. It was much harder in the eighties to go after law enforcement um, departments because lawyers just wouldn't take the cases. Um, Whereas where now, you know, the struggle is sort of getting these officers criminally charged, but civil cases are much easier to pursue. It was very much hard fought in those days to even have someone take a civil suit for a wrongful death. So for many, many years, there really was no course of action. And it was really a group of very um, progressive left-leaning lawyers that formed a group called the Police Misconduct Referral Service uh, that came together and said, okay, um, they actually were contacted by David Lynn, that Marine we were speaking about earlier. He knew about what was going on in Linwood. And together they decided, all right, like, let's go after the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and get these people some justice. We mentioned earlier the connection to these gangs and uh, the prison system. And like, again, a lot of the power of what we think of as like traditional like street gangs. And like I said, in the popular imagination, like their criminal network and power is very much tied to like the control they have in prison, like in their connections to people who are, you know, locked up. And, this is very much the same with, I think, like, was it the Wayside Whites or, or Whiteys? You mentioned that deputies start out 
in working in the prison system. So like the connections they form there and the the criminal law that they enforce within the prison system as you know p- p- custodians of it. Could you explain how that works? Yeah. So, I mean, mostly they they use their role as custodians for the county jails. The county jails here in Los Angeles are operated by the sheriff's department. Um, and they just use that to really abuse people like horribly. I mean, you, it's possible for like any, anyone that's interested can, can go online to the sheriff's department website. And there are years and years of reports of abuses tied to deputies working in the county jails. And these aren't gang members. These are just deputies. Like, I don't know if they're gang members, but these are documented abuses. There are thousands of them. Um, And really what's happening, what I know to have happened with alleged gang members, that's really a small fraction of what's happened. We know that police can be brutal out on the streets. And, you know, I've written about, you know, at least 40 cases where that's happened. And, the thing about the jails is that there's really no one there to witness that. So what's happening inside there, I believe to be much, much more rampant than what we're, what we can see out here on the streets. What we see out here on the streets, I think is sort of a more toned down version of what happens to people in the jails. So as, as, as part of, um, uh, knock LA publishing this, you guys, you've, they've also created a searchable database of like every, all information related to these deputy gangs. Like, uh, how does that work? And, and like, how, how, like, w- how can that be used as a resource for people like sort of cracking open the door on, like I said, this cu- culture of absolute depravity and lawlessness? Yeah. So the database that, uh, that we built, it lists all of the names and gang affiliations of deputies that I've identified in the course of my reporting. It also lists any cases that they were involved with. So if they killed someone, if they beat somebody up, we've listed that. And we've also got, I believe they're um, working on getting their positions, the last known places that they were employed, where they were assigned, that sort of thing, and how recently we know that they've been working. And the hope with that is that people... Um, can be more aware of who exactly is patrolling their streets and hopefully they they can be safer hopefully you know they can avoid these people i i hope i hope that you know maybe they'll the past couple of deaths we've seen at the hands of the sheriff's department um, in the past month have been families that called asking for help um, because their family member was experiencing a mental health crisis. I hope that, you know, getting this information out, um, you know, the fact that several several deputies that are listed as gang member affiliates on that list actually killed people in mental health crisis calls. So I hope that by sharing this information, people can can be more aware and maybe seek seek assistance in other places because the sheriff's department, they're, they're not assisting. They're killing people. And they got because they've got a quota to fill if they want to get their sweet tattoos. Like so, there's I think like eight, about eighteen that we that we know of, or you were able to confirm about eighteen like currently active gangs and cliques within the LA County Sheriff's Department. And then like this was uncovered, like a lot of you, uh, this was sort of cracked open through filing uh, what is sort of the California State version of the Freedom of Information Act. Yeah, uh, I did it. It's an act called the California Public Records Act. Um, I I like it a little bit more than FOIA because um, we have a tighter deadline with CIPRA. Um, So the information, sometimes it comes faster, but sometimes, you know, law enforcement agencies like to play games. Yeah, I can can imagine. I guess, like, here's a question. Like, since since this series has come out, and like I said, you were compiling and, and creating like a, a sort of historical thread that uh, you know comprises like all the available information that is able to be reported on the proliferation of these gangs and their conduct over the last 50 years this is something that you said that like if you live in these neighborhoods in LA has been an open secret for like as long as you can remember um, has any of like the local Cal- Los Angeles or California or national news media at any level picked up this story at all uh, well, CBS had some reporting on the Banditos um, earlier this year. Um, that's that's really all that I'm aware of. Um, 
if we're looking at government agencies themselves, um, you know, all all local government in Los Angeles has been aware of this problem since at least the early 90s. Um, the California state legislature um, also had testimony uh, regarding this issue in the late 90s, as did the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, which is a federal agency, um, and, and no action uh, no significant action has been taken um, in the past 50 years. Like LA local media, are, are they just mostly like they do not want to touch this at all? My impression as someone who's worked extensively in LA local media is is sort of what I said earlier. I mean, this is a story that's about poor people. It's a story about poor black and brown folk, people that have been ignored um, and passed over since the inception of LA media. This is a story that I've certainly shopped around to other shops and no one wanted to do it. No one wanted to fund it. Um, you know, and like I said, I think that is just more vestiges of white supremacy. And I'm grateful to knock for giving me the platform to publish this, to help me fund, you know, $3,000 worth of public records. It's not cheap to do this work. And I'm hopeful that, you know, since everyone got caught with their pants down on this, as far as covering it, there's a little bit more pressure to actually do the work. And like in considering all the information that you compile here and the really just chilling level of brutality and, and violence that we're talking about here, I mean... To what extent do you think some people are looking the other way, not because they don't know any better, but because they do know and they know too much about like the risk that they might be taking in, you know, looking too deeply into this story or knocking on too many doors or making, you know, one too many phone calls about these gangs? If anyone in power is feeling that way, they should give up their power. Like <laughs> I mean, I know, like, as a journalist, you never want to be become part of the story yourself. But, I mean, did I read that you're now wearing a bulletproof vest when you leave the house? Um, I won't say how often I'm wearing the vest just for my own safety. But, yeah, um, I don't I don't go to. Well, I'll tell you that I'm not a, I'm not reporting in the field anymore without wearing some kind of protection. I'm not I've hired bodyguards to accompany me when I go out and work, which, I mean, sucks as a journalist. I, I don't like having a, you know, a minder, if you will. But, you know, I've, I've had credible threats on, I've had repeated credible threats on my life. And I'm not planning to die <laughs> at the hands of one of these people. I guess just, you know, in closing, I mean, like, it, like I said, it's a, a, a really stunning piece of work that you've done here and it's one that ha is you know terrifying and like it probably like it's a kind of terror that pe many people have been living with as a daily reality for like a long time so like to, to open this door it's really uh yeah terrifying to consider what the overall implications of something like this like the, like i said that this culture proliferating to the extent that it has and how everyone seems to just like look the other way when it comes to it like i mean we're obviously in a moment now in this country where police violence is a, a major issue and becoming one more and more. But like, how do you, how do you view like, like the, this phenomenon, like this culture of gangs within police departments as part of like, what are the implications for like the, the, like the entire country at a moment in which like police violence is very much at the forefront of a lot of people's minds and in the news? Well, already I've learned that there are deputy gangs operating in other departments in California, and I know of at least one national uh, group um, of officers. It's a motorcycle club. I'm not sure if they've engaged in criminal activity, but you know that that exists. So I don't. I don't think this is an isolated issue. I think that versions of this are playing out across the country, and. I think that I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think that, you know, the same reasons that I mentioned earlier that this issue has been ignored are present in other places as well. And I hope that, you know, by by writing this and by publishing it, it inspires people to, you know, turn over some rocks in their own backyard 
I mean, I, I guess the answer is obvious, but I mean, like, just the implications for our society that, like, the most dangerous criminals imaginable are have badges. I mean, like, just what that represents, because if you're, like, you know, like, you know, the type of, oh, you're, like, a, like the, the crime that people are afraid of, like, you know, street crime or drug dealers or gangs in their neighborhood, like, even at their worst, they're not backed up by the full weight of, like, a state authority. And that the fact that, like, these people are self-consciously copying the codes, behavior, and, like, violence of criminals with a badge, like, an undercover of that authority is just, like I said, it, it's, it's sickening to think about. I mean, I, 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 don't, I kind of don't know what to say. Yeah, it's, it's, it's horrible. And I hope that by putting it all out there where people can't look away from it, it, you know, pressures some people to, to be accountable, because that hasn't happened for 50 years. Well, Cerise Castle, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you for all the work you've done on this extraordinary story and this 15-part series is at Knock LA. We will have the uh, link in the show description. Uh, Cerise, thank you for joining us and please stay safe. Thank you. Okay, we are back. I want to thank uh, Cerise Castle again uh, for joining us. Um, but now in the second half of the show, uh, we've got Felix with us. Hello, Felix. Hey. <laughs> how's, how's it going? Um, how's it going? All right. A beautiful uh, 451 uh, morning near sunset right now. Monday. It's uh, April 26th. Can't go wrong with that day. Almost in May. Hell yeah! You got That's a few days. You got a few days left. You still got April business to do. Well, don't worry. You got five days. More like four by the time you're hearing this episode. Don't worry. You didn't do all your April chores. If you didn't, you know, clean your apple bucket or uh, <laughs> re-oil your butter churn or enlist in the u.s military whatever you were supposed to do you got four days and you have tonight's sleep and maybe you'll come up with a solution to those problems tonight while you're sleeping well uh you know if you listen to the first half of the show we uh you know discussed one of the more uh like you know terrifying and uh sobering uh news stories that we've come across lately but let's uh let's try to switch gears here and talk about something uh, a little bit more lighthearted. and by that i mean uh news reports that um <laughs> immigrant children were given care packages that featured Kamala Harris's picture book. Did you guys hear about this? Yeah. Um, this was, I mean, the last uh, thing like this that I remember was when, you remember when Obama gave the Queen of England an iPod with her his speeches on it? <laughs> that was really <laughs> oh, God. funny. I'd forgotten about that. That's, but that's like more defensible because it's like, well, fuck her. But yeah, like, she's with, the queen. Yeah, with, with this, it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, why would you do that? I mean, you know, and like the the White House is saying that, like, you know, like, oh, we don't know how the Kamala Harris kids' books end up in these care packages. We weren't administering them. We didn't demand that the, <laughs> the kids be, uh, you know, uh, indoctrinated into Kamala Harris thought uh, while they wait in our, you know, detainment facilities. But um, look, I don't know what, what's 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 the problem. The, the kids they get a nice book, and you know. The, the billing, it'll only be out of their canteen. They'll never even notice. <laughs> um, so I was, I, was, I was reading about this story uh, th today, and I had no idea that Kamala Harris wrote a children's book, and I'm looking at it on Amazon right now, and it looks like she used the same artist that did the, the Krasenstein Brothers children's book, like about Donald Plump and Robert Mueller. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Even, the, they, they've got like some guys from the Philippines on Fiverr. Yeah, that's that's what this shit looks like. Um, look, looks like trash. But uh, I was uh, e even better. The title of the book is "Superheroes Are Everywhere." It's true. Well, you then, would deny that? Wow. <sighs> um, it says here from Vice President Kam Kamala Harris comes a picture book with an empowering message: "Superheroes are all around us, and if we try, we can all be superheroes too." Sit on a microwave until you develop magical powers. Uh, it says, before Kamala Harris was elected to the vice presidency, she was a little girl who loved superheroes. I, I'd, like, I'd like some investigative reporting to look into, you know, did she even buy comic books when she was a kid? This seems like cap to me. I think we might have a fake gamer girl on our hands. 
Yeah, um, and, well, yeah, Kamala's timeline's always, like, fucked up. It's like she's always trying to take, like, the cool thing from, like, whenever she was young. But it just, it spans across, like, several ge- generations. Like, she's, like, a millennial Xer boomer. And it's, like, depending on who's talking to her. Like, when she was in college, she was listening to, like, Tupac, who I think was, like, dead by her <laughs> sophomore year. Uh or like hadn't come out yet, I forget. Um, yeah, yeah, she was like, yeah. Or, in but, college, but, I was listening to Lil Nas X. Yeah, now it's like, um, oh, I was, uh, I, I was, uh, I was, I was reading Scott Pilgrim when I was a kid <laughs> in 2003. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm uh, 23 years old. I uh, just reading from the uh, the the jacket copy here. It says. And when she looked around, she was amazed to find them everywhere, in her family, among her friends, even down the street. There were superheroes wherever she looked, and those superheroes showed her that all you need to do to be a superhero is to be the best that you can be. In this empowering and joyful picture book that speaks directly to kids, Kamala Harris takes readers through her life and shows them the power to make the world a better place is inside all of us. Uh, basically with fun and engaging art as well as a guide to being a superhero at the end this book is sure to have kids taking up the superhero mantle cape and mask optional so uh, you, you're vice president of the United States encouraging children to engage in vigilantism not cool in my opinion yeah um, well could they give them like Hunter's book instead <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's like, like a, that, that could make inspiring. everyone happy yeah. Yeah. yeah they should give like the the kids should be able to pick books. Like obviously we need these places. Obviously we need to just like keep having these forever. Yeah. You know, this thing that's not an like probably only existed since like two thousand nine. We obviously need to have it f- forever. Mm-hmm. But um we can give them a choice of the Hunter book, uh Joe's book, which is like you you know, my life of being a senator and my sweetie sweetie Good, good guys. Uh, or the Don Jr. book, where he like proposes the sun contest. I think I, I, I would love Joe Biden to write a children's book. He'd probably be really good at it. It would be like it, it would. He would accidentally like write a Cormac McCarthy book because it would be like <laughs> anecdotes from his childhood in 1912. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like it's like uh, there's a guy that lived on my saw, block, saw, Mac. Saw, his yeah, name was saw, the Judge, uh, big fella, no hair. Yeah, they saw they saw like a, there's like some a bunch of sordid tales where like a drifter rents out a room in the Biden house and they he's just never seen again and his dad's wearing different overalls in the mor- in the afternoon than he was that morning and it's just, it's like a very tree of life thing where you're going in and out of fragments of memories. See the kid, his blonde leg hair is in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just another phenomenon of uh, uh, children's books being written by politicians. I mean, I mean, it really does tell you where what they think of you. Like they used to pander to you by by pretending to have written a full book, you know, three hundred pages, even maybe uh, a cable a cable of contents in there. You got some fucking citations. Hey, maybe what's this? These are uh, uh, ooh footnotes. Even now, it's like. Here's ten pages of uh, of a machine learned drawing of a duck, telling uh, saying that uh, you know you should recycle, and that is how they communicate to their ostensible uh, their ostensible audience of voters. Felix, I, I know I know you saw this. Uh, did you see the story today that was like had me raise an eyebrow because it was like U.S. Coast Guard gets into like you know uh, you know high tension situation with the Iranian Navy off the coast of like some country in the Persian Gulf. It's like the U.S. Coast Guard. What okay, the so, fuck? Yeah, Why are they, like, I, what are they doing? I, I, I'm just coming out of an argument about this, and I saw people that were like, uh, actually, that unit of the Coast Guard was created because they have a special boat that uses patrols. Uh, for, for for larger naval vessels, and it's like that doesn't make it any less fucking stupid. So yeah, like the a- specific <laughs> unit of the Coast Guard was created in two thousand two, like presumably <laughs> pretty far in advance, or not pretty far, but like in advance of like the Iraq War and existing and assisting like existing operations, which also shouldn't have existed at the time. But it's like I know that like respect for the military and everything pulls highly, but I feel like. If most Americans who told them, oh, we have to create a special Coast Guard unit because we're so 
we have so many fucking assets that are just dicking around in the Persian Gulf that we need patrol boats for them. I don't think they'd be in favor of that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> just, yeah, the headline for the Wall Street Journal is, Ships from Iran's elite Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps harassed two U.S. Coast Guard vessels earlier this month in the Persian Gulf. It's just that in the Persian Gulf thing, and like with the Coast Guard, is just goddamn the, the 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 whole world is America, or at least that's the way we see it. Yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's, it's in the title, the Coast Guard. They're supposed to be guarding our coast. Yeah, any coast, <laughs> all yeah. coasts are American coasts. Yeah. That's the rule. I mean, like, the U.S. Empire is awful and a just awful, murderous machine. But it's hard not to see every story that really comes from the Persian Gulf as anything but a bouquet of laughs. Do you remember, like, la uh, two years ago, it was like every week it seemed like a fucking $20 billion ship was getting lost? In yeah, the they're just Persian wandering Gulf. around in the in the in the open sea and then just crash into each other yeah and and it would always be like it would be like um the possible iranian harass harassment of these boats and then it'd be like very quietly a week later um no actually we just we fucked up sorry uh but next US time this happens it will be iran's fault uh uss nimitz suez canal speed run go <laughs> You're, so you said it feels like, like this is a part of the coast guard that is like the elite of the elite of the coast guard they're yeah. called the, they're called the gulf guard <laughs> yeah this they're, is, they're, they're to, you remember they're, that they're coast to guard, guard movie that, that ashton kutcher was in and, Ke and kevin costner yeah it was yeah, about the, re the rescue divers they would be in, in real life <laughs> okay so movie pitch here it's the an elite unit within the u.s coast guard like the special operators of the, they're known as the gulf guard i'm imagining jared butler as the head of a gulf guard ship who is like, you know, is in the Persian Gulf, who has to like, you know, one boat against like one big boat against like, t you know, 300 smaller IRGC speedboats. And it's just it's a boat. It's a boat action movie with Gerard Butler as as a grizzled veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard. That sounds great. Yeah. And he has to um, he he fucks an M.E.K. stripper. <laughs> <laughs> and again, full penetration in real time. 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. And uh, no, it's like, I was thinking maybe he's retired from the Gulf Guard, but he has to come back for one last mission because like his, his close friend at the Coast Guard Academy was on that boat that like around boarded and like made them all sit on the ground drinking apple juice or whatever. And he's just like, these bastards will pay. Yeah, no, there, um, he should have, we should, ju this should just be Den of Thieves. Like just Pablo Shriver should play an IRGC Coast Guard guy. <laughs> <laughs> and they should there should be like a constant like cat and mouse game like that this is a cool movie it would only cost um three billion dollars to make because we are going to be blowing up real u.s navy ships. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to sink an aircraft carrier yeah. in the persian gonna, gulf will be the climax yeah. of this movie we have a really cool idea for like a throwaway scene that you we're probably just going to cut out of the movie for time but it's going to be on the dvd of an FA-18 Harrier crashing directly into a 60-floor skyscraper. <laughs> That's uh, because he's getting a blowjob. The guy was flying the FA-18. And we plan on using a real pilot who does have terminal cancer or otherwise wants to kill himself for this scene. We haven't figured out how we're going to get his dick sucked. Probably CGI. But uh, this scene alone is... One billion dollars. The movie. Wait a minute. If it's a CGI blowjob, I'm walking. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. That's, that's worse than squibs. God damn it. See if there's someone who can give him a blowjob who's also has terminal cancer and can die for this. Thing. <laughs> we will not if be you, using squibs for the cum shot. That's yeah, Matt wants only, you only make real a, ropes. Yeah, if you can make a guy <laughs> who is flying an F A eighteen, uh, if you can do it quick enough that he comes, uh, and you're dying, like we won't feel bad about it. like you want to contribute to a piece of art that will last forever contact us if you're a cameraman who also has terminal cancer please let us know and if you're a key grip actually they don't have a union i don't think so it's like we can just kill one <laughs> yeah no big deal if you're a key grip just regular contact us we'll just uh we'll we'll, we'll get we'll give the camera to one of scott rudin's assistants and just strap him to the nose of a harrier <laughs> jet and be like yeah you'll, you'll just go do your thing Go do you think you're an asshole and just give me give me a goddamn latte before you do? No, not after, before. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Gulf Guard, 
Gulf War. Yeah, no, no, yeah, Gulf Guard. The Elite of the Coast Guard, starring Jared Butler. Um, I'll be working on the screenplay and pitching that shortly. Um, here's another thing I was uh, thinking about today. Uh, did you guys see the news that generously the United States is now going to make available 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to the world? And it's just like, world, we're, we, got, we got you covered. We've got 60 million of you covered. How generous. And the worst, we're giving them the worst one, the AstraZeneca <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the shit like, I, one. I mean, like the thing about this is like, I mean, like the, really the broader issue here and the thing that's going on right now is that like the Biden administration has like I think I believe India requested help with you know vaccinating the the billion people that live in that country. Um, but like this is in the context of like the Biden administration refusing to uh, strip patent protections from like Pfizer and Moderna for the creation of these vaccines, right? Because it's yes. just like. Yeah, I mean, like, the idea is, like, look, yeah, oh, like, you know, look, it takes a long time. There's, like, 7 billion people on the planet. We got to, you know, got to keep producing these vaccines or whatever. But, like, the formula, the recipe to create these vaccines exists and is being basically firewalled through U.S. copyright law, which is, like, I mean, to ponder the insane greed and cruelty of making a profit off the development of these vaccines is pretty staggering. But also it's, like, suicidal because... This is a global pandemic, right? And if we don't vaccinate enough people, the virus is just going to continue to spread and mutate and we're going to deal with it forever, which actually may be the point as far as these like Pfizer and Moderna goes as companies. Because if, like, if this just keeps mutating, they can keep charging people money to get like the next vaccine. That's what I was thinking. I mean, I, at first, I, there's this really good article about how Bill Gates personally fought for a lot of, uh, of the copyright uh, shit with just like not freeing the patents for the vaccines uh, that yeah we can put in the episode description if I can find it but uh, I was thinking like okay well this seems counterproductive right you'd want to get rid of this as soon as possible to get rid of global commerce and then like obviously yeah Pfizer and Moderna charging more money blah 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 that's definitely probably a part of it but I also think that there's probably a non insignificant part of the US government and people like Bill Gates who might as well be the government uh who are like well in some just insane like imperial way of thinking are going well this is a way that we can get sort of a head start on the rest of the world yeah if you're considering everything a great game and that we're constantly in competition with forces like China or like yeah just Brick countries in general or something this is something you'd probably do that you think would give you a competitive edge if you saw the world that way which gates absolutely does look guys if if this stuff got uh opened up and if these these patents were were uh waived then this mrna technology could be used by other countries to uh heal their people and that would undermine our competitive advantage. Just cannot cannot be allowed to happen. Sorry. And I mean, I think I think Bill Gates recently was was asked on like a television interview whether he would uh, you know support um, removing copyright protection for these the vaccine formulas, right? And he said no. And his his justification for why it's not a good idea is he was like. He was like, countries like India don't have the manufacturing capacity to like have a vaccine factory that is like up to like the regulation that, you know, is demanded of the, the scientific and industrial process of producing large numbers of these vaccines, which is like, I don't think that's true. And also, if that was the case, like Bill Gates could pay out of pocket to build vaccine factories that are up to code in every country on the planet. Bill like, Gates, no, no yeah. problem. Bill Gates is one of the most evil people alive, and uh, I, I really, there's a lot of stuff that made me mad about early COVID and early vaccine coverage, but I would say the thing that probably collectively annoyed me the most was how it had to become like a liberal mission to defend the reputation of Bill Gates. I mean, like, yeah, a lot of that QAnon shit about him is goofy, but like, I don't care. If somebody in Nebraska thinks that he worships Satan, I don't care. He might as well. Who fucking cares? Like, this guy is about as evil as this QAnon depiction it. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this whole play with India, it's all a way to leverage 
as many foreskins as possible out of India. Yeah. Like this all ends with just like DC tens full of foreskins going directly <laughs> to, to Washington, to his fucking headquarters for him to do whatever the hell it is he's doing with them. Yeah. Just like if this guy's a pure philanthropist, why is he so invested in maintaining the patent law for this? I mean, it's it's perverse enough that you can't sing happy birthday in a movie without paying someone. But like the, the, the ways in which like like patent and intellectual property are used to you know safeguard the profits of the companies that created these vaccines, which is like, oh, like good for you. Like, yeah, you created these vaccines in a year. Like how, how marvelous as a pharmaceutical company, I guess your brand could, could never be better at this moment. But, like, you're already making a killing, literally, by charging $700 for, like, a vial of insulin or whatever. Like, is this not enough for you? Like, I mean, just the idea of, like, this vaccine that is everyone on the planet needs if we're going to, like, I don't know, have a continue to have a civilization as a species. But, I mean, like, like I said, like, compare that to uh, the guy who created the polio vaccine, who, like, specifically yeah. declaimed any copyright on it. And he was just like, I didn't. I didn't create this to make money off of it. This is just so, like this is for the knowledge that like I utilize to create this vaccine is like the birthright of every human being on the planet. Bill Gates officially a shittier guy than someone from like 80 years ago. Keep in mind 80 years ago if you had a kid you and you just like didn't like the color of their eyes, you would just sell him to a farmer. <laughs> like you would just like you would have nine kids cuz you're going to be like well, six of these are I'm not really going to like, and I can just leave them on the side of a road. My mind's made up. I've given this long and careful thought, and it has to be medical experiments for the lot of you. You would have nine kids because before the polio vaccine, at least one of them was going to die or be crippled for life from polio. Yeah, but it came from a harsher time, and even that guy's a better person than eternal demon, Bill Gates. I mean, I've, uh, so, um, thanks to a CBD that I've, been purchasing at a gas station uh, and the Dark Souls games have a new theory of humanity. <laughs> it's basically the Jews and several other people are descended from gods, but that Anglo-Saxons are descended from uh, the furtive pygmy. And they have this thing <laughs> called the Dark Soul. Bill Gates, Anglo-Saxon, definitely has the Dark Soul. How does this fit into the Shinto uh, is real thing you that should you're working be, on? You, like, you should treat nature well. Okay. Like, but, regardless, but not Anglo-Saxons because they're actually uh, demons. No, they can be fine. Like the Dark Soul isn't like you can use it for some stuff, but uh, you know you also shouldn't let them like have their own place. Like if you if you <laughs> let the Anglo-Saxons have their own country or city, it's gonna be bad. But like you can, a Jew and an Anglo-Saxon can create like a really cool type of person. Um, and yeah, no, we Jews have this thing called the entertainment soul. <laughs> That's very important to us. But this uh, mainly, I just wanted to talk. Like Bill Gates has the dark soul, though, obviously. Yeah, he's probably the king of the pygmy. Queen Elizabeth is just an illusion. It's really Bill Gates. He's the global leader of the Anglo-Satanic dark soul caliphate. Well, thank you, Lyndon Larouche. Mm -hmm. Can we synthesize Larouche thought and Dark Souls lore? Could you sort of quarterback this project in the coming months? Yeah, I'm, I'll circle back to this one. I mean, we clearly need a new religion. That's That's been clear for a while. And I think uh, it should probably, a big portion of it, whatever, if it's coming out now, will have to be inspired by video games. I mean, that just yeah. seems to be make sense. And Shinto, I mean, Shinto is like, there's a lot of it I don't fully get because i don't speak japanese or read it or understand understand any of it but also like the parts of it i can pick up are like you know you should be nice to trees like you should uh thank the wind or something and it's like <laughs> yeah i think shinto is true because like if your entire thing was like you know be nice to trees and shit and like rivers are good and you got you were going to get invaded by Mongols, and the Mongols got fucking owned by a tsunami. That's something nature would do for you right? if you were nice to nature. So it's like, that's cut and dry, pretty true. Yeah, That's a true religion. That's one of them. Yeah, look out for that new religion dropping. Uh, yeah, you know Q four twenty twenty one. It's called. Well, it will be called True Religion. Yes, we're stealing the name from the uh, <laughs> the jeans brand, but that's only because this is the only religion that is true. And you get a free pair of jeans when you sign up. I gotta say, like 
That makes me think, you know, sort of just circling back to copyright law, people like to bitch about a lot of stuff that China does, but one thing they do in China that I love is when they just like take an American copyright and are like, no, nah, fuck you. <laughs> what are you going to do, sue us? Like how they had like a fake Apple store. <laughs> like it had Apple products and shit, but it just like They're doing the Nathan Fielder store. thing as a nation. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. It's so fucking sick. Okay. Like, I love that. If there are any CCP party members out there right now, could you please do a version of the happy birthday song that smashes the yeah. copyright on that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sick of those fucking Hill sisters just sitting on top of all of that filthy lucre. <laughs> yeah. Doing that's awesome because it's like, okay, before, before they like really industrialized and became an economic power, you do that before it's like, okay, well, yeah, what are you going to do? Fucking come over here and sue us? Like, no, but you do it after it's like, oh yeah, what? Well, um, yeah, I, I hope the RIAA sues us. Uh, yeah, it would be, be a shame if anything happened to any of your manufactured goods that we make. Like, you can't do anything to them. It's awesome. China should create their own version of Twitch where you can just play whatever music you want. Yeah, oh, watch man, movies that would rule. And just watch movies just, with your Yeah, friends. just watch the movie instead of having to make people watch it at home. Oh, God, yeah. that'd be sick. The only thing is there will be no depiction of ghosts or time travel. That's that's <laughs> those are the, that's the shit that they will not let you fucking uh, put on uh, screen for some reason. Uh, go, ghosts are childish. Time travel is uh, overdone. <laughs> it's, it's a stale plot device at this point. My problem with ghosts is like, there, okay, there seems to be about like 100 ghosts in the world. How many people have fucking died? Like it's billions. true. You think there'd be yeah. more wait, wait, ghosts. Wait, wait, wait. How did you come up with the number of there are a hundred ghosts in the world? At uh, Quora. <laughs> <laughs> My I problem mean, with ghosts: there are way too there are too few of them. Can we get some more I mean, ghosts here? A hundred that might be under a ballparking it, but we I think everyone can agree that there sure as shit isn't as many ghosts as there are dead people. Yeah, it's like it's or anywhere close. This might be a Shinto thing though, because. Okay, maybe I got this from a movie that I don't remember, mm -hmm. but I did see something that was like um, someone had to like avenge their. This actually might have been a game, and this was <laughs> definitely over fifteen years ago. So my bad if I'm not remembering it right. But it was like someone has to avenge their family because if they don't, like they'll be ghosts. <laughs> like they can't <laughs> go to the afterlife yet, and it's like, I mean, I'll accept that as an explanation. So you're saying there's like most people, um, if, if, if a family member is uh, killed in some way, will follow up with vengeance to ensure that their soul enters the afterlife and is not haunting uh, the place where they died. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I would have to remember what movie or game or show or like pamphlet <laughs> or maybe even thing I invented and forgot about from, you know, like 2002 this is. But uh that I don't know. It's like there definitely aren't a million ghosts, right? We can safely say that. No, I, I'd say that. Yeah, there's not a million ghosts. Yeah, and... I don't know. I think you guys are lowballing this number here. I think there okay, are, how many, there could how be many? potentially there could be billions of ghosts, but many of like I think most of them could just be well behaved and they're not interested in haunting people. Okay. They're just well, the they're just interested you, in looking at women who are nude in the shower. If, if you, you can't, can't interact, off. if you can't interact with the ghosts, and it's like that's we're not we're talking about real identified ghosts here how many Act actually <laughs> encountered ghosts are there it's yeah i'd say less than a million easily yeah no it's just the science doesn't hold up is there any like authority we could ask on this like someone who knows a lot about it ghost the ghost hunters probably yeah yeah the, the guys who like walk around like houses with night vision goggles <laughs> yeah like, and just say, what was that yeah. They're walking around uh, like an, an abandoned uh, sanitarium that's been like just turned over to nature at night. And they're just like, guys, there's a seriously spooky vibe here. I, there's something weird going on here. And it's like, yeah, no shit. Dude. Whoa. Hey, that, I mean, that door, that door. There's a handle, Dude, right? My back's to this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Cool, cool. That door just uh, opened like. I'm assuming there's some type of knob or something. I'm not even sure. I want but to know what's behind it. It sounded like something turned the door and opened it. <sighs> wow, this place is crazy. <laughs> You're in a condemned <laughs> hospital at three in the morning. What do you? What the fuck? They're like, did you hear that? Like, that, what I like about ghost hunters is like most ghosts are actually just problems with plumbing. 
It just pipes yeah. rolling, basically. Or like a deer. Like, that's my point. Like, those guys never found ghosts. Yeah. yeah. Like, if there was anywhere near the number of ghosts uh, as there are dead people, they would have seen them by now and not just had these shaky cam uh, fucking videos that don't show you anything. I, I mean, I, yeah, I know I'm not the first person to make this point, but, like, doesn't the fact that, like, literally every American have, like, a video recording device in their pocket at all hours of the day kind of, like, put the lie to the existence of ghosts, aliens, and cryptids? Like, wouldn't there have been some viral footage of Sasquatch or a ghost by now? If yeah, it was, like, it, I, have I would say yes about the ghosts, but not about Sasquatch because Sasquatches, they uh, are off the grid by definition. Yeah, they're, right, they're yeah. out there in the deep woods. The, 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 you might only have like a, a, a very low level likelihood of ever having a human encounter a Sasquatch in the first place. And then it is more likely that they would make eye contact and have like a spiritual moment that would prevent them from even considering taking out their phone. Yeah. Okay. I think I've actually come to something. Um, I've noticed that like of the people I've known in my life who have claimed to have ghost experiences, all of them were really fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no way. But, surprised but, me. But I don't think this means ghosts aren't real. I think that maybe there's like a mental threshold you have to get below in order to see ghosts. Mm. It's like the opposite of like sort of uh, like the level of knowledge. Like in Lovecraft, you need like a level of knowledge to like ascertain great ones and like cosmic influence. I think there's probably an opposite thing where it's like certain things will only reveal themselves to, like, the dumbest people. Yeah, was that, like, you, you, you said, you're like, your, your friend who claimed that there was a skeleton outside their window giving them the finger? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's... Man. <laughs> yeah, why would he be doing that? Because, yeah, he's just, like... Because he's badass. He's just... Yeah, he's yeah, <laughs> he's scary. Cool. He's, he's cool. All right, um... What say Andrew Sullivan, Andrew Sullivan, ladies and gentlemen, who has certainly uh, been been uh, you know stirring things up uh, as usual. The way he you know he look look he just like he he j he's just asking questions about um, eugenics and skull science and like you know in, in a civilized liberal society you should be able to bring up these topics without being shouted down. Um, all kidding aside, though, like I would like Andrew Sullivan to be deported from America probably more than any other naturalized citizen. Like I would like to send him back, like by, mm -hmm. by any any like just send him back to England. He does not deserve to be in this country. Um, this is an Andrew Sullivan article from April second, two thousand. This is twenty years ago, and I forgot that it existed. But this is this is some some pretty pretty top tier Sullivan here. This is in the New York Times Magazine. It is a really long piece. I'm only going to read parts of it, but it is called The He Hormone. And this is about Andrew Sullivan's experiences with injecting himself with synthetic testosterone so he could feel sort of virile again. Um, and, you know, and obviously, like, you know, masculinity and gender has been like, you know, a, a big hobby horse of Andrew Sullivan as of lately. I mean, probably the the only thing he likes asking questions about, uh, probably second only to uh, race science, is you know, uh, trans issues. And okay, so like, so here is Andrew Sullivan, the he hormone. Uh, it begins. He says, "It has a slightly golden hue, suspended in an oily substance and injected in a needle about half as thick as a telephone wire." I mean, <laughs> what is the, this is the the H hormone. He's just shooting heroin. That's it makes you feel great. <laughs> You cook it in a spoon before finding a vein. He goes, I have never been able to jab it suddenly into my hip muscle as the doctor told me to. Instead, after swabbing a small patch of my rump down with rubbing alcohol, <laughs> I push the needle in slowly until all three inches of it are submerged. Then I squeeze the liquid in carefully as the muscle often spasms to absorb it. My skin sticks a little to the syringe as I pull it out, and then an odd mix of oil and blackish blood usually trickles down my hip. So first paragraph, we're getting a fairly vivid description of Andrew Sullivan's rump and the black blood that oozes out of him uh, when he sticks a telephone wire-sized needle into his ass to feel like a man again. Okay, um, should his b blood be black? <laughs> yeah, that seems like something you should look into. Yeah, yeah. Hey, gu hey, hey, guys. So short blog today. It turns out I'm a demon. 
<laughs> yeah, I just, uh, it, I went to the doctor because I was having a headache. It turns out I'm growing horns because I am a devil. Yeah. An evil chaos demon. And so I have to go to CVS, but here's some, here's some links I thought were interesting today. And uh, cat video, of course. Yeah, I went to uh, the dermatologist because I thought that I had a rash, and it turns out those are scales. <laughs> <laughs> scales this whole time, not actually human uh-huh. skin. Hey, guys, been do- going through a lot with my therapist. I thought I was born in 1968. Turns out I'm an eternal demon. I've always been alive. My bad. I just keep forgetting after all. It's like, oh, right, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. That time I burned down Baghdad with my fire breath. <laughs> He goes, uh, I am so used to it now that the novelty has worn off, but every now and again, the weirdness returns. The chemical I am putting in myself is synthetic testosterone, a substance that has become such a metaphor for manhood that it is impossible to forget it has a physical reality. 20 years ago, as it surged through my pubescent body, it deepened my voice, grew hair on my face and chest, strengthened my limbs, made me a man. So what, I wonder, is it doing to me now? He then goes on to just describe what testosterone is and how it make, make, forms the you know, basis of like sexual dimorphism or whatever. Uh, he, he, you know, he says uh, he, he took it because you know, uh, he's HIV positive and some, one, a side effect associated with being HIV positive is having your testosterone levels fall to a, a very low level. And he saw a doctor and he was like, oh, hey, uh, I'm, the, my, there's not enough tea in my bloodstream. So... He goes, at that point, I weighed around 165 pounds. I now weigh 185 pounds. My collar size went from a 15 to a 17 and a half in a few months. My chest went from a 40 to a 44. I mean, yeah, this is just like his grinder profile. That he's here. <laughs> I'm even, even un, more uncut than I was before. <laughs> my, my foreskin has gained seven I bet, inches. I bet the end of Andrew Sullivan's cock is just like, it's like a wind cock. <laughs> like the foreskin is like so fleshy <laughs> like you can you can just like if he doesn't take a shower for like two days there's just an entire like triangle of brie in there if he opens it up <laughs> stop <laughs> stop <laughs> he goes says he says uh, he says he can squat more than 400 pounds Felix Ooh. do you believe him do you believe him um a uh no but <laughs> like b I think, like, it, he could be one of those guys who, like, uses the leg press and is like, oh, that's the same as squatting. <laughs> so Maybe, though. Up. I mean, he's, like... He's sort of stocky. He, he he's did, kind of a stocky guy. He's a stocky dude, and testosterone replacement therapy is pretty strong. Um, it's medically necessary in the way gambling is to make a man feel cool. And, uh, <laughs> he can afford, like, coaching. So, like, maybe yeah. he could. I mean, how old is yeah. Andrew Sullivan? Uh, well, shit. This was written in two thousand. Guys, yeah, like you know, middle age. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I, I would guess he's in his like fifties or sixties by now. I'm not sure. Okay, so he was probably like thirty when he wrote this, right? Like at yeah. least, like at most, like thirty five, right? Like safe, safe guess. He's fifty seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think at the time of him writing this, yeah, absolutely, that could be possible. He goes on to say, depression, once a regular feature of my life, is now a distant memory. I feel better I feel better able to recover from life's curveballs, more persistent, more alive. These are the long term effects. They are almost as striking as the short term ones. Uh, he goes uh, you know, he goes on to list the benefits of like this uh, you know, uh, super super semen uh, formula. He goes here, um, because the testosterone is injected every two weeks and it quickly leaves the bloodstream, I can actually feel its power on almost a daily basis. Within hours and at most a day, I feel a deep surge of energy. It is less edgy than a double espresso, but just as powerful. My attention span shortens. In the two or three days after my shot, I find it harder to concentrate on writing and feel the need to exercise more. My wit is quicker, my mind faster, but my judgment is more impulsive. It is not unlike the rush I get before talking in front of a large audience or going on a first date or getting on an airplane, but it diffuses in me a less abrupt and more consistent way. In a word, I feel braced. For what? It scarcely seems to matter. I like when he says, like, my wit is quicker and my mind is faster and I feel a rush like I get before uh, talking in front of a large audience, going on a first date, or getting on an airplane. Like, I, which one of these things doesn't belong? Like, does he feel nervous before getting on an airplane or does he feel infused with a surge of, like, nervous excitement and energy? Well, those, okay, so those uh, things he, uh, he listed, those are all the same event to him. <laughs> 
he's getting on the airplane. He's going to fuck a guy in the bathroom. And then he's going to get out and take the plane hostage, which involves public speaking. And he does that every time he gets on an airplane. And it's a lot of work, and it takes him a very long time to get where he needs to be going. He goes here. He continues. He says, uh, then there is the anger. I have always tended to bury or redirect my rage. I once thought this as an inescapable part of my personality. It turns out I was wrong. Late last year, mere hours after a tee shot, my dog ran off the leash to forage for a chicken bone left in my local park. The more I chased her, the more she ran. By the time I retrieved her, the bone had been consumed, and I gave her a sharp tap on her rear end. Um, whether any you know black viscous ooze um, came out after that tap on the <laughs> dog's rump is uh, unreported. But he goes here, uh, I, 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 I gave her a sharp tap on her rear end. Don't smack your dog, yelled a burly guy a few yards away. What I found myself yelling back at him is not printable in this magazine. He's, <laughs> it's probably a racial slur. I mean, yeah. it was probably. <laughs> I later realized that the testosterone was causing me to have hallucinations. The Tom of Finland drawing that had come to life. Don't smack your dog, yelled a burly biker, sailor, or policeman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. He goes, uh, but I, he says, I have never used that language in public before. In private is another question. Uh, let alone bellow it at the top of my voice. He shouted back, and within seconds, I was actually close to hitting him. He backed down and slunk off. I that, strutted- guy's, that guy's lucky. He could have died that day. <laughs> oh. One punch from Andrew Sullivan. Oh, homie. Oh, my God. If you ever <laughs> yell at me walking my dog. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, yeah, what, what happened if you saw Andrew Sullivan in a level five yard and he just pulled up his shirt? <laughs> if he just pulled up his shirt and showed his his T muscles? That's why he's like. That's why he's like experienced like no health consequences because of stevia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he goes. Uh, I, I strutted home, chest puffed up, contrite beagle dragged sheepishly behind me. It wasn't until a half an hour later that I realized I had been a complete jerk and had nearly gotten into the first public brawl of my life. I vowed to inject my testosterone at night in the, f- in the future. Like- <laughs> <laughs> Under the light of a full moon. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, yeah, this isn't testosterone. This is him being aware that he's a demon. This is a, He's consuming one of the Dark Souls. Yeah, no, this is... Anglo-Saxon. He's level. He, he's consuming a dark soul um, and the paladin ashes, and he's going to use it to level up his chest <laughs> stats, <laughs> a racial slur numbers, intelligence, <laughs> faith. <laughs> he goes here. Uh, that was an extreme example, but other milder ones come to mind: losing my temper in a petty argument innumerable traffic confrontations and even slightly too prickly column or email flame out. I love that he's attributing all of this to the synthetic testosterone, but like, it may just be that you're an asshole, Andrew. It may just be that like people don't like you and you're, you're kind of a, you're kind of a cunt and you know, in public and private. Well, that, that is what people like the actual more scientific consensus around steroids and, you know, testosterone all steroids mostly do a lot of the times like, you know, augment your testosterone production, but uh, more testosterone just makes you more of who you are. Yeah, it's like alcohol. The general consensus actually is. Like, roid rage is yeah, not really a thing. Like, if you if you have roid rage, you're probably already a pretty angry person. Yeah, like, yeah, like drinking. It's just, it, it, drinking only allows you to be like, it unleashes your cool potential that's inside yeah, of a man. Yeah, and what yeah. you do when you're drunk is only a reflection of like how cool you are to begin with before you started and, um, hitting the bottle. Yeah, and when you smoke weed and you get those paranoid thoughts that are like, all my friends hate me, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> real. I do. All yeah. of your friends hate you. Everyone you hates that. you. Anything positive in your life is the result of an elaborate prank or people feeling sorry for you. You yeah. suck. You actually do have the smallest dick or um, largest wi- widest <laughs> pussy in the world. I don't know. I don't know. It's bad for women. Um, he goes one on day your... I'll see. One day I'll see one and I'll know. <laughs> Every time I think they're going to be on the front. Nope, they're on the bottom. By the time I make that mistake, girls already left. It's like you've never located one of these before. No, I've never been given a second try. 
He continues, no doubt my previous awareness of the mythology of testosterone had subtly primed me for these feelings of irritation and impatience. But when I place them in the larger context of my new testosterone-associated energy and of what we know about what testosterone tends to do to people, then it seems plausible enough to ascribe some of this increased edginess and self-confidence to that bi-weekly encounter with a syringe full of manhood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay All right, i mean he goes on to talk about like scientific experiments where they gave um like you know uh female rats testosterone and they grew penises that then started fucking the other rats and then uh the opposite happened to men that they uh male rats that they gave um uh they testosterone blockers or like estrogen to or something uh, there's a lot a lot of boring bullshit that just simply I was just like, you know, David Attenborough style stuff about like, mm, you know, the male zebra bird, uh, you know, can sing. But when you give female birds testosterone, like they can sing, too. It goes on and on. I, I mainly like this art, art like, you know, <laughs> I mainly like this, uh, this, this article for just like um, him telling you about testosterone like you've never heard of it before or like uh, sexual difference or something. But also it's just like, like I said, the classic move of just like being like, mm, once I got my Superman injections, I found myself yelling at strangers in the park and being an asshole to everyone who worked for around me. Like, it's just, it's just like attributing like his, like like you said like his own re- insane, ridiculous behavior to, uh, and then like putting in this gloss of just like the masculine essence that I was infused with has made me <laughs> stronger, wittier, and hornier. Is he still on it? I, I would assume so. Yeah, you kind of have to do it forever. Or else, like, your dick doesn't work if you stop. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do they tell people that before they start? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, it's like, good. You're not like, all right, good. Just so you know, you never stop taking that. Uh, say goodbye to your dick. Yeah, like, you testosterone's so good that it's like, you're like, all right, man, I guess I'll keep having these shots forever. I mean, every that's the thing. Every rich guy does it. Like, oh, yeah. Jeff Bezos is definitely on TRT. Oh, Bezos for sure. Yeah, he, he, him, uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. And, not uh, he on is team. on the exact same stack as J.K. Simmons, and they are melding into being the same person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Bill Gates, not like probably not. Bill Gates is probably like probably foreskins. Like, he just grinds them up in his fucking yeah. bullet every morning. Yeah, but like most actors, like Tom Cruise has amazing genetics, right? To look like that, and he's like eighty three years old. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But also, and like that's a lot too. of yeah, that's a lot of chemical help. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes on here. When you hear comments like these, it's no big surprise that strutting peacocks with their extravagant tails and bright colors are supercharged with testosterone and that mousy little male sparrows aren't. It turned my life around, another man said. I felt stronger, not just in a physical sense. It was a deep sense of being strong, almost spiritually strong. Uh, so basically, like the, like the, the strongest uh, men on the planet are like 15-year-old boys. You know that they're, they're the most spiritually <laughs> yeah. pure, witty, and 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 pure beings of the male gender. Uh, testosterone's antidepressive power is only marginally understood. It doesn't act in a precise way other antidepressants do, and it probably helps alleviate gloominess primarily by propelling people into greater activity and restlessness, giving them less time to think and reflect. This may be one reason women tend to suffer from more depression than men. Okay, so I finally figured out what he's doing in this article, is that he's just doing gender science because like he got bored of doing race science all the time, he's just like taking these like uh, discrete scientific studies about the effects of testosterone on animals or whatever, and applying this gloss to uh, human interaction in society in a way that oh, wouldn't you know it? Conveniently casts him as smarter and better than everyone else around. So like this is this is this is Andrew Science is attempting to like uh, measure penises instead of skulls. Like get the, he's applying the calipers to a different body part essentially. Did, it, did, did his dick get bigger? This is a question that, uh, I mean, the fact that he said it, he didn't say anything about it makes me think it didn't. Oh, no, there is something from the, about this in the book of Piana. Rich Piana oh, yeah. talked about this in a video. Steroids and tea don't make your dick bigger, but they make it appear bigger because your balls get smaller. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, Got yeah. The one-time yeah. Jimmy and the itty-bitty. Sex. My balls shrinky dinky got the roid so strong. strong. But it makes the aforementioned Jimmy Jam look long. And that's, yeah. That's straight from the word of God himself. Uh, this, is like, this is the last paragraph I'm going to read here. He just says, unlike Popeye's spinach, however, testosterone is also, in humans at least, a relatively subtle agent. It is not some kind of on-off switch by which men are constantly turned on and women off. 
For one thing, we all start out with a different baseline level. Some women have remarkably high genetic T levels, some men remarkably low. Although the male-female differential is so great that no single woman's T level can exceed any single man's unless she or he has some kind of significant hormonal imbalance. For another, this is where the social and political ramifications get complicated. Testosterone is highly susceptible to environment. T levels can rise and fall depending on external circumstances, short-term and long-term. Testosterone is usually elevated in response to conf confrontational situations. A street fight, a marital spat, a presidential debate. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. that's high that's high T. That, that is Donald Trump, high. the highest T man in the world. <laughs> or in highly charged sexual environments like a strip bar or pornographic website. It can also be raised permanently in continuously combative environments like war. Although it can also be suddenly lowered by stress. So just a little, a few tips here in case you're, uh, you know, if, if your T levels are feeling a little bit depleted, um, just go to war. But not a stressful war. If you're in a yeah, stressful yeah. A war. Chill, a chill, yeah. like, uh, sort of uh, vibe wave war. Yeah. He goes on to talk about Mark McGuire and baseball. Like, I, I can't stress how long this, this article is. Let me just, uh, this is the last paragraph, he goes, for my part, I'll keep injecting the big T. Apart from how great it makes me feel, I consider it no insult to anyone else's gender to celebrate the uniqueness of one's own. Diversity need not mean the equalization of difference. In fact, true diversity requires the acceptance of difference. A world without the unruly, vulnerable, pioneering force of testosterone would be fairer and calmer, but far grayer and a duller place. It is certainly somewhere I would never want to live. <laughs> a world full of women. Yeah, we get it, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the planet of pussy. <laughs> suck. He's like a he's like Burgess Meredith in the Twilight Zone, where he's like, "Time enough at last," and then like his tea vial shatters, and he's like, "No, <laughs> no, it's not fair." His dick just d dissolves and drizzles on his pant leg. Yeah, his balls are huge; like his <laughs> balls go bo out both his pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a nuclear bomb kills every woman on the planet, and he emerges from the bank vault, and he's like, "Ah, paradise." <laughs> the tea, yeah, and then his tea vials just, uh, yeah, he, he drops them on the ground. That's not fair at all. There was time now. Uh, he goes, okay, perhaps the fact that I write this two days after the injection of another 200 milligrams of testosterone into my bloodstream makes me more likely to settle for this colorful trade-off than others. But it seems to be no disrespect to womanhood to say that I am perfectly happy to be a man, to feel things no woman will ever feel to the degree that I feel them, to experience the world in a way no woman ever has, and to do so without apology or shame. To boldly experience what no woman ever has before <laughs> or ever will. Well, no woman has ever gotten on an airplane. <laughs> They're afraid of them. <laughs> women think women uh, like don't have the again Lovecraftian insight to see what an airplane is, and that's why Wonder Woman's plane is invisible. Yeah, they literally can't; their minds can't comprehend it, so it's just nothing. Yeah, they're like uh, they're like uh, pre-Columbian uh, Indians seeing the uh, the ships. That's my favorite bullshit thing. <laughs> that is such a <laughs> that is such a stupid person fact. Yeah. Right? I, I fucking love it. Yeah, that is one of the yeah. That's a great a great like tell that you're. Just that's a, yeah. It's a great barometer. Moron. Yeah, it's a great barometer for what it, like how much of a nitwit the person you're talking to is. <laughs> yeah. If they if they bring up uh, facts that they learned in the what the bleep do we know metaphysical documentary series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I it's like finally though like my last thing I, I love that he says it like. You know, perhaps it is just uh, how the, the milligram, the, the testosterone coursing through my bloodstream that makes me more likely to settle for this colorful trade off than others. Like this is something that's on offer. It's just like, I, I hope I never have to make that decision, Andrew, to live in a world without testosterone or not. But uh, thanks for thanks for chiming in that um, you're perfectly happy being a man and that you don't feel the need to just, you know, apologize for it. And in fact, I'll suck you in the goddamn jaw because my tea is so powerful right now. I feel like fucking Popeye. It's it was cool when like blogs were like whatever the fuck this is. They really switched it up. Like it used to just be like bullshit, like total bullshit, like this. Now it's like a different type of bullshit where it's like 
WandaVision, uh, why WandaVision like makes me hate my stepson or something. I think yeah. about all those polyglon blogs that were like, uh, you know, I tried to make my son play Wind Waker and it made me realize what a fucking piece of shit he was because he couldn't appreciate it. A world without tea? No! Come back, tea! <laughs> tea, come back! I can't, I'm, I'm sounding like a squeaky voice teen because I had all my tea removed. I can't do push-ups anymore. I can't get in fights with people in the park. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just think it's like, it, it's easy to like see in this article both the the lineage of his prodigious work studying race science to like his current position of investigating trans issues or like his, the sort of the gloss, the sheen on reality that like he sees the world through. The scientific one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Biology, baby. Yeah. Science. <laughs> and like I can't I again I can't really describe to you how much of this article is based on him undescribing like wacky scientific experiments where they like, you know, bimbofied a fucking peak of uh, bimbofied a rat or something. <laughs> so there we go. Uh Andrew Sullivan, hi T. Get out of my country. 